Welcome to Oregon Voters Digest, the program that brings forward the social and political issues that are important to people living here in the Pacific Northwest. And now, your host, Bruce Broussard. Welcome again. To, welcome again to this segment of the Oregon Voters Digest. I'm Bruce Broussard, your host. I tell you, folks, we, we've been off for a month, and uh, gee whiz, it's been it's been good. We've been very relaxed and the like, and uh, we've got a lot of work to be had here. There's a lot of things going. As you know, we're right into the summer months and this, that, and the other. And the biggest the biggest thing on our our plate, if you will, are the activities, if you will, of of uh, of what happens, if you will, on the street. And in most cases, we got a lot of things talking about the whole issue of police. We just had a shooting here in the Portland metropolitan area. A uh, young kid basically was just hey, out there, and and he just fired off some rounds up in the crowd here at, at some art show up here in northeast Portland. And uh, a kid, just a kid. Yeah. So, so anyway, but the bottom line is that we'll probably go a little bit more in, into that. But but what we're going to do, we're going to start focusing, if you will, on, on some main issues that are affecting us all. I'm not going to get into national issues at this point in time, but one issue that we're very, very much interested in is the whole issue of, uh, of law enforcement, you know, police work. You know, we, we, we've, been, we've been bombarded, if you will, by the East Coast uh, about, um, about shootings and, and police work and this, that, and the other. And so um, we're fortunate. So we're going to be fortunate this time around. I've got a gentleman with me that I've known for a number of years, but at the same time, uh, He's 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 been in an area, been employed, if you will, by by Portland by as a, as a peace officer with the Portland Police for about 17 years. Yes, sir. About 17 years. I'm talking about Don Dupay, who's sitting here right near to my, on my right and on your left, if you're looking at the show. And Don just recently wrote a book. He just wrote a book, uh, Behind the Badge in River City. Boy, what an exciting book! I tell you, I read it. And I, I read it front to cover uh, to to back. I mean, it was, was an enjoyable book. And, um, and so I really appreciate the fact that he, he dotted the I's and crossed the T's for me. And so what I'm going to do, I'm going to have you give you an opportunity to share this. But the bottom line, like he told me once before, when he, before he got here, he said, Bruce, I'll come on, you read the book. <laughs> and boy, I tell you, he, he, I mean, he did the right thing. He really did the right thing because there were some things there that I had to just look at myself. And all of a sudden it was filling, it was a, it was a, good, it was a good book to read. It was an easy read, if you will. And um, and especially the the fact that he had names of people that I I was familiar with, and uh, and places, etc. And that during that time that I was here, right out of the Marine Corps, it was very very interesting. So so anyway, so you're gonna have quite a time here with me today with with Don Dupay, my friend Don Dupay. Don, how you doing, bud? I'm good, Bruce. Good, good, I'm enjoying good. being here. And good, uh, good, good, good. But what we're going to do, I'll tell you what we're going to do. What I did, just to make sure that we get right down to the meat of the matter, so rather than I doing all the talking, I'm going to let you do some, do a lot of the okay. talking. I put down, we put down some questions here that I'm going to be asking, and we're just going to go through them, and then periodically I might stop you for a moment sure. and just get, get a little bit more of it. Okay, so again, Don Dupay, uh, uh, give us a bit, just a little, just a quick background in terms of uh, the years that you were on Portland Police, and just a little upfront, how you got on, how you got on the force, and and just go through a little. I got, out of, I got out of the U.S. Navy in 1959, <clears throat> and uh, I joined the Portland Police in 1961 in April. Uh, I took all the tests, passed the psychiatrist, got myself buffed up so I could pass the uh, physical exam, uh, and joined. Uh, in 1961, uh, they did not have a police academy uh, right off the bat, so I was able to work the street. In a suit because I didn't even have a uniform. Really? You, they didn't even you know you know, I wore a suit and I had a, a long barrel thirty-eight like okay like Elliot Ness. Was that an issue? Was that an issue? Did no, you? I had to buy my own. You had to buy your own. Gun. Yeah. <laughs> I had to buy my own gun, <laughs> and we worked uh, for about ten days before I was able to get a voucher to get a uniform. But I'm probably the only one of the few living policemen that actually worked in the Albina district. Wow. In 1961. And that's Northeast Portland. That's Northeast in, in Portland, okay. uh, Williams Avenue. It used to be called Union Avenue. Right. Now MLK, uh, the Albina District. Uh, I actually worked the riots in 1967 that's, uh, that's in the book. There's a lot of stuff in the book about my time on the police department right. that 
is uh, descriptive of the times mm -hmm. because things have changed quite a bit. Some of the laws have changed. Okay, okay. One of the things is uh, now commonly police officers, uh, they handcuff people just to make sure of their own safety. Mm -hmm. Uh, that wasn't allowed when I was a policeman. If you really? if you didn't if you weren't under arrest, we couldn't handcuff you. Hmm. And if you weren't under arrest, we couldn't search you either. Hmm. It was none of the stop and frisk, pat down stuff at, in those days. Hmm. So we took our chances. We did the best we could. Well, did that change during the time that you were on the force? It did not change. Didn't change. It did not change. Seventeen years. Seventeen years. Well, my time on the street mm -hmm. from 1961 to 1967, that part never changed. When I became a detective in 1967, then, then I'm not sure what exactly happened on the street because in the meantime, the Miranda situation had come along where we yeah. had to advise people of their rights. So things began to change from Miranda Was that a good thing? Was Miranda that a good thing? I think it was thing? a good thing. Okay. Sure. Okay. Uh, the police didn't think it was a good idea because they were put, well, now, if I tell you you don't have to talk to me, then you're not. Mm -hmm. But ultimately, it really didn't make any difference because... It seems to be human nature, the compulsion to confess. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So whether I advise you over your rights or not and tell you you don't have to talk to me, you're going to talk to me mm -hmm, mm -hmm. because you want to. Mm -hmm. I'm going to be nice enough to you mm -hmm. that you want to talk to me. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I'm the good guy. Mm -hmm. Tell me what you did wrong, Bruce. Oh, yeah, I got you. <laughs> will, will I? <laughs> <laughs> well, look, I'll tell you what. Uh, I don't want to get too much in your book because I want these folks to buy the book. Because I really, I it's too. really an enjoyable read. It's a very enjoyable read. And what I want to do is I'm, I'm going to get into these questions aspect of it. Sure. Because, because the issues that we're having with police now today, mm -hmm. I mean, we've got to solve the problem one way or the other because yeah. in all due respect, at the end of the day, uh, we want public service. Everybody is identified in public service. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the, the force is really the people's force. It you is. Know, it's a people's force aspect of it. And, you know, I, I can still remember on the cars they used to have, you know, uh, Portland's finest or on all cars for that matter. And protect and serve, right. or was it serve and protect? Which was it? Which was it? Protect and serve. Protect and serve. Protect yeah. and serve. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And uh, that that had a lot of meaning to the public from that standpoint mm -hmm. aspect of it. Okay. Well, so, Bruce explained there's a lot of stuff in the book, and I call it stuff. Stuff. Okay. And this this is some of the stuff. Good. So you like the, you like some the, of the question. Stuff is in is okay. in the, is in so the book. Let's go down these. Let's get down in this stuff. Okay. <coughs> okay. Okay, first off, first off, community policing has been a buzzword for 50 years. 50 years. At least. Can community policing ever work? Is it realistic and can it be done in Portland? First define what is community policing from an officer's standpoint. Community policing is getting out of your police car, walking a beat, talking to people. Mm -hmm. uh, you get to know the officer on the corner because he's, he's there all the time. Uh, that's what community policing is, talking to people, not riding around in a patrol car. Mm -hmm. Will it ever work? It never has worked. And the reason it never has worked is because it's expensive. Expensive in it's what way? It's expensive I mean, because you got a guy on the street, he's walking around, mm -hmm. he can't cover a lot of territory. And you got a guy in a car, he can cover more territory, but he's not available. So getting people out of the car, letting them walk around, has always been too expensive to implement. And so. That eliminate that puts it to the point where it's just a buzzword. Mm -hmm. It's a buzzword. We talk about community policing, but we're never going to do it because it's too expensive. But think about it now. Community policing, when, if they said you got to set areas, one, how many officers are assigned to that area, and uh, do, are they assigned to? Like, let's say like, you got these divided into four areas. Let's say, do you have a, a specialist in each of those areas and those four areas, and kind of get well, a sense of knowing people within that particular areas? My district was from F Fremont to Killingsworth, okay, and from the river to Fifteenth Street. Okay, that's uh, quite a geographic area, but really very small, actually. Okay. okay. Uh, we did get out of the car. We did walk around a lot, my partner and I. Mm -hmm. But you get to know people. You got you to get know, to know people. Yeah, I got to know people at Van's Olympic Room, mm -hmm. uh, King's Tavern, Paul's Paradise, uh, the Theme Tavern, the Red Sands. You Paul. Paul. Paul Knowles. Paul Knowles. Yeah, yes. Yeah. Paul Knowles of he, Paul's he, Paradise. He's identified uh, as the mayor of the Northeast Portland. Yeah, that's what I've heard. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Paul's quite a guy. So those were the those were the times where. If you're going to do community policing, you're going to need more than two guys running around in that area. More than area. two guys, okay. You're going to need okay. more than two. You're going to need five or six. Okay. You're going to have maybe two or three walking on the, on Williams Avenue, mm -hmm. uh, checking the bars, because mm -hmm. those are the dangerous places in those days. Really? Yeah. 
Like what? Well, I mean, they were dangerous. In what way? Uh, I can remember the time when King's Tavern was so dangerous. There was a shooting, a stabbing, usually once a week. Uh, my partner and I went in there often and got into trouble a couple of times. So there was a time where we didn't go in there without three policemen. Hmm, hmm. Where's the physical to... location, let's say, today? Where, where the, the, uh, uh, King's Tavern was on Williams Avenue, somewhere in the vicinity of Skidmore. Street. Skidmore, okay, yeah. okay, mm -hmm. good. Okay, That's good. where it was. All right. Van's Olympic Room was another hot spot uh, on the corner of uh, uh, Vancouver and Fremont. Okay. And uh, was quite dangerous. There was a lot of heavy-duty drug dealing in and out of there. There was prostitution in and out of there. Uh, I got into trouble there one night working vice. Almost had to shoot my way out of the place. Uh, uh, the guy that operated the place, Leroy Clark, was actually killed in there by the SWAT team wow. in, in later on in years. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it was just a dangerous place. The whole atmosphere of Williams Avenue and the Albina District in those days was dangerous. Hmm. It was just dangerous. Hmm. Did, did you and, see any solutions? Were there, did, did you see any of the so-called leaders and, and let's say, elected, elected politicians, were they aware of that, that situation? And I what think, were they doing? of course, they were aware. Uh, I don't remember who the mayor was, but the police department, that they were not conducive to helping us out a lot. Hmm. We had a rule that says you could not have anything in your gun except factory loaded 38 uh, round bolt, round nose bullets. Hmm. And we could carry, we had six in the gun and six backup. So we went to, we went to work with 12 rounds. Mm -hmm. Now they go to work with 50 rounds. 50 rounds. At least 50 because there's 14 in the Glock. And they got two more clips of 14 each. Mm -hmm. And uh, so there's a lot more firepower. What we did to, to, to eliminate that nonsense, because here we got Don McNamara, who's the chief of police, telling me I can't have, I can't be as well armed as the guy on the street. Mm -hmm. So what we did is we hand loaded our own ammunition. Huh. We went home and we put as much powder and lead as we could stand in the gun. Mm. Uh, I didn't have a Magnum, but I had a 38, and we loaded up the ammunition to the point where, bam, just about blew up a gun. Was, just that, that, a close. was that a violation, though? Of course it was a violation. Okay. It was a violation of a... Everybody was doing it? So everybody was doing it. Mm -hmm. And uh, some of the guys actually did carry Magnums mm -hmm. uh, in violation of, 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 the, of the, the procedures. Okay. But we had to do that to protect ourselves. Okay. You know? okay. But, but that was always... You basically set that to the, the chain of command yes. and told them what the problem was. Did it go all the way back to the to the chief, if you will, like, like the mayor? I mean, that, that's no. They didn't. Uh, they didn't care. This was the rule, and you did it. And you did it. we policemen have always protected themselves against the structure, the structure, the command, the command structure. We don't care what it is you say. We're going to protect ourselves, mm, mm. and so. We did. Well, should they, they should, should have been aware of that situation, though, as far as the command structure. I'm sure they were aware, but I'm not sure they, they were on the they street cared. at one but point then, in time. But then, but then when they were on the street, it was a little different, too, many years before. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, so when Don McNamara was a cop on the street, it was a different story. Mm -hmm. There weren't all those rules and regulations, mm -hmm. so. Okay. All right. We did. We did. Anything else on community policing you may want to? Should we should we do this today? I mean, should should, should there be community community policing? Yes, there should be community okay. policing. Will it ever happen? No. It won't happen. No. Interesting. Mm. Not unless you increase the budget, yeah, and put on a thousand more policemen, okay, and get rid of all these police cars. Okay. Oh, get rid of the cars. Get rid of the cars. Get them out on the beat. Walk get them the out beat. on the beat. Yeah. Okay. Good. Okay. Has reducing weight, and height and weight requirements been a good thing? You know, we 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 did that transitioning thing. During your time when you were there, when you first got on, was there sort of a standard uh, height and weight? You had to be of... five foot eight. Okay. And uh, weight and height in, in relation to to height, uh, you couldn't be any shorter than five foot eight. And uh, when the affirmative action rules came down, it destroyed that. It said that anybody can be a policeman uh, if you're five foot two. Five two. Yeah. The problem with that, Bruce, and let's be realistic about this, is everybody out here on TV has heard of the Napoleonic Complex. The mm -hmm. shorter the man, 
uh, the more the more authoritative they are. And that's uh. Napoleon. So you get a lot of short guys. Sorry, officers. But you get a lot of short guys that are made even more. Uh, that me it affects their personality more when you take a short guy that's five foot three and you put him in a uniform and give him a badge and a gun. Now he's more easily becoming a tyrant. Mm. 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 So that's what you get. It's mm. been a terrible mistake. Huh. They should never. They should go back to the old rules. Five eight. Yeah, at least five eight. I think that Washington State Patrol officers are all very tall. They're six foot or so. I don't know how they manage to avoid that. And what's that rationale? For the five, the <laughs> you're five. big and you're tall. Okay, a so policeman, it's a deterrent, so to speak. A policeman should never have to look up to a suspect. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's just. It just isn't right. You mm -hmm. need to look down on somebody that you're arresting. Mm -hmm. You need to be in charge. Bigger is better. Mm -hmm. Some some say today people, a uh, lot, lot of officers shoot first before they <laughs> shoot first to react to the to whether the issues or whatever. What do you think about that? Well, are, are we, are that, we that's partly shootings? that's are partly we having more true. more shootings now than we were than we were doing yes. that day. Yes, and for several reasons. One of the reasons is you got more ammunition. More than had 50 rounds. You got guess. 50 rounds. Yeah. So you can you can fire off eight or ten rounds, uh, and they do. Mm -hmm. We only had six rounds, mm -hmm. and the first thing I learned is you make the first one count. Mm -hmm. To hell with the other five, mm -hmm. because reloading a revolver is a problem. It is takes it a, time. Now tell me about this. Is it a shoot to kill? I mean, you know, when you think about the Clint Eastwood thing and. And maybe shoot the leg or something. What, no, what, you, what can't you, you can't, can't do that. You can't do it. Why is that? Because it's just not practical. It's not practical. Okay. Uh, you have to shoot until the threat no longer exists, and that's the only thing that makes any sense. Mm -hmm. uh, I can tell you a story about a man that was shot with a 357 Magnum. His heart was completely blown up. I know that because I went to the autopsy. Mm -hmm. He didn't have a heart, wow. and he'd been shot at about uh, 10 feet away with a 357. Did he fall down and die? No. He was standing in front of a tavern. He opened the tavern door. He walked in. He walked around two pool tables, headed back toward where the restrooms are located before he finally fell down. Hmm. If he'd have had a gun, he could have kept shooting. He could have been shooting. He could have been dangerous. So the only thing that makes any sense is to shoot until the threat no longer exists. And that's, that's, the, and that's the training. Now, that's the training. That's the, the training, and there's no such, there's nothing in the law about a warning shot. You mm -hmm. can't just bang, bang, stop, or I'll shoot. Mm -hmm. You mm -hmm. can't do that. And to try and shoot somebody in the leg, it's just not okay. practical. Okay. Now, 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 is that, that's, again, that's part of training, right? That's part but of now, training. That's yeah. the sign off. That's the sign off. Now, as we, the people, we're represented by the mayor, right? Basically, right. elected mm -hmm. officials. Mm -hmm. We sign off on that kind of training, right? This is not something that you guys do on your own, right? Am I fair? Am I that's right? That's right. That's right. Okay, okay. That's we need right. that. We need that. That's a point that we, that I think that really I, I came out of the book that I saw and, mm -hmm. and from the standpoint, who's in charge, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Are the police in charge or, or is it, are the people in charge? Yeah. The people that normally <coughs> are in charge, right? Through the elected officials. Fair? Yeah. Okay. I think one of the problems, and I'm going to mention it here, is, and you're talking about the command people, the mm -hmm. people who make these rules, is they allow these officers to carry automatic pistols. Okay. One of the problems with automatic pistols, and you can check on YouTube, on how to clear a Glock. I don't want to know how to clear a Glock. Hmm. I just want to shoot. Mm -hmm. So automatic pistols jam. That's the nature of the beast. Hmm. And if you only need, if you only carry a pistol, if you only use it one time in your life, and it jams on you, you're in trouble. So I wouldn't allow any of my policemen to carry automatic pistols. Mm -hmm. I'd go back to revolvers, which never misfire and will never let you down. Mm -hmm. Now, you're going to get a lot of arguments about that from guys who want to fire out bang, 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 bang. Mm -hmm. But it's wrong. Oh, wow. Okay. It's wrong. What, what about this? What should be the role of women in police work? Now, that's a pretty, that's a pretty tough one. That, I know that's a pretty tough one there, buddy. I, that's part of the stuff that's yeah, in the book. That's yeah. pretty, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But what, what, what do you say, just, just, just on the surface, what, what do you think about women on the police force? What, when you were going, when you were there? When I joined the police department, they had uh, the, what they call the Women's Protective Division. And basically, women were social workers. If we had a child that was lost or a problem like that, uh, if we had to have a, a woman come to a situation, 
we had, we were able to call the women's division. Okay, oh, there was a women's there division. Women's, oh, there was a so women's division. So they were on. They, yeah, they were on. They were yeah. here, but they weren't allowed to ride around in police cars, mm -hmm. and they weren't allowed to wear a blue uniform. Mm -hmm. uh, I personally think that that's a mistake. That's why, just my personal what, what because. Think? A woman doesn't belong in a police car. A woman is not as strong as a man. Okay. Uh, they put themselves in more danger. And then when you add a one-man car or a one-woman car, now you got now you got a problem. The, the, one the word car. the word that was when I was on the street was, if I got a woman in the in the district next to me and she gets a call, now I got to go protect her. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Or if she's coming to me, if she's coming to work to back me up, now I got the same problem I had in the first place. Now I got her to worry about. Mm -hmm. I got her to worry about. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, I just don't think that women should be as involved in the street process of police work as they are now. No, okay. I'm sorry. All right, all right, let's see. Call me old-fashioned, Bruce. Well, hey, but um, it's, I think that's wrong. In the Marine Corps, we had sort of had some similar kind of. It's paramilitary kind of. Yeah, you know, it's, it's a very dangerous situation. Are, are one-man cars practical or even safe, and how has that change impacted current officers' safety? One-man one one cars was, I think, a, a, a feeble attempt at spreading the wealth, if you want. Uh, community policing, you can have okay. more people out if you put them in cars, but that has never worked. You get a call, you send a cop, backup's going to show up. Hmm. So that car who's supposed to be out there doing something else is not doing something else. He's backing me up. And that leads to policemen getting hurt as well as citizens getting hurt because of their words that should never, ever come out of a policeman's mouth is, I'm waiting for backup. No. I'm waiting for backup. Never. Bulloni. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. You should never have to wait for backup. Mm -hmm. You don't send a single soldier into a combat. No, we don't. You don't. Why do you send a single policeman into a war zone? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's, well, well, it's wasn't economic. That, well, wasn't not, that discussed during your, your, your era, your time? Yes. Well, why, why didn't it change? I don't know. But hey, you, I don't know. There's you, a lot you know of, the chain of command. I mean, there's, you, you a lot of, you. Uh, there's a lot of conversation about one-man cars, and I've always thought it was wrong. It's just not safe. Mm -hmm. It's not safe for the public. Yeah. Okay. Okay. How many people, uh, you can talk about Mike Brown, or Mike Brown, he was shot because Officer Wilson was waiting for backup. Hmm. He shouldn't have been waiting for backup. No. Mm -hmm. Okay. What is the single most important thing in police work? If I would ask you that question. What, what, you, what would you integrity, say? Integrity, Bruce. Integrity. What does that mean? Integrity a means... Word. a big word now. Integrity means that you're not going to lie on police reports. You're not going to embellish the police report. You're not going to lie for a fellow officer. You're not going to fudge on the honesty of an affidavit for a search warrant, which was common in my day, mm -hmm. common. Mm -hmm. I mean, the first thing I learned, the first thing I learned, and it's in the book, is how to lie out a police report. Mm -hmm. And how, yeah, and how, and how uh, important uh, getting your 12 traffic movers a month was, and somehow, Honesty in police reports wasn't important. It was the 12 moving violations that you had to get that made a difference what happened to the guy that you said. A lot of folks were doing that? Um, yeah, mm -hmm. doing it on the street. Mm -hmm. I can relate a short story that's in the book, which demonstrates oh, yeah. the point. You gotta, get the book. you gotta get the book. It was a good, it was a good point you made, too. Yeah. Well, what about a degreed officer? The difference between a degreed officer and a non-degreed officer. Let's say one had an associate degree or didn't have or just a just high school education or whatever, a high school diploma. Maybe he spent two years in the military and he's out. Uh, what do you think? Do we, do we well, need... I, the better educated the police officer, the better. Okay, okay. But having said that, they don't teach common sense in college. Hmm. And if you don't have common sense, you can't be a policeman. Yeah, yeah. And common sense, I don't know where it comes from, but it doesn't come from college. So if you don't have common sense, you're wasting your time as a policeman. Mm -hmm. Should that be included in there? Huh? Is there any way of identifying common sense in the, in the interview? I don't know how you identify common sense. You just know it when you see it. Common sense is not common. That's common. That's what they say. I got you. I got you. Oh, wait. What about this one here? This is going to be a good one thing here. 
has arresting prostitute ever been effective? And we've been having a prostitutional situation for years, and yeah. they're, they're saying that prostitutes will never stop. I mean, but but what about? Well, we arresting? arrested prostitutes when I was first on the vice squad in the early '60s. Uh, I've always thought it was a ridiculous waste of time. First place, I don't believe in arresting prostitutes. Mm -hmm. Why is that? Though? Well, is that? I think that if there was a solution to the problem of prostitution, if it is a problem, and I'm not sure it is, somebody a couple thousand years ago would have figured it out. <laughs> you know, we wouldn't still be having stings mm -hmm. where we trap the poor guy or the poor girl into thinking, you know, I'm really not a policeman. That goes back to the morality of vice work too, is lying about it. You know, you're, you, you're working vice, you go into a bar, you're trying to pick up a girl. Are you a policeman? No, I'm not a cop. I'm a logger from out of town. Mm -hmm. You're lying. So when you get into vice work, lying is how you do your work. Mm -hmm. When you're in uniform, you're up front about it. I'm a policeman, here I am, it's my mm -hmm. uniform. I'm a cop, I'm not lying about nothing. Mm -hmm. But when you talk about vice, it's a whole different situation. Mm -hmm. It brings up this morality mm -hmm. issue of, of uh, uh, what should I be doing this? One, one of the things that we had to do uh, when I worked for Carl Crisp, who was a vice commander at that time, we got my partner and I, we got 25 bucks drinking money. 25 bucks drinking money? 25 bucks drinking money. And that mm -hmm. was our job. Was, or sent to do something. You go out and you go to the Globe Theater and see how many gay people you can arrest, or you go to this bar and you see how many prostitutes you can arrest. And so you're sitting there in a the bar and you're drinking. Okay. And then you go out and get into your police car and drive to the next bar. Oh my God, you're drinking and you're driving. Should a policeman be drinking and driving and then arresting somebody too? Jeez. A couple of days before that, I'm a traffic cop. It's my job to arrest people who are driving and drinking. Mm. Mm. That's the morality, the whipsaw part of it that I never could, ever could uh, resolve in myself. So, so folks who were drinking while they were doing that kind of work, what, could they resist the whole issue of alcoholism or something? Or did, uh, did you see any, 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 at, any at, problems with that? At issue? first, at first, it sounded like a dream job. Yeah, yeah. You know, okay. I get to go out and drink on company money. Yeah. But at, but after a while mm -hmm. and a short while, oh my God, I got to go drink again tonight. Oh my God, I got to go drink again tonight. That really got to be the a job drag. already stress. Is, stress that's, yeah, that was stress alone. And then you've been drinking all night, and then you're going to drive home at four in the morning. Wow. Wow. What impact does this have, if you will, on just doing your regular job like police work? Well, it distorts it, that's for sure. Mm -hmm. Are you being honest about what you're doing? Should you be arresting somebody when you're drunk? Should you be arresting somebody when you're high? Mm -hmm. No, I don't think so. This is a tough job. It's a tough job, Bruce. It's a tough job. It's a tough job. And somebody has to do it, right? Somebody has to do it, yeah. I'm glad that there are still young and naive people who want to do it, mm -hmm. because if you don't come into the job with that kind of naivety, that idealism uh, and to begin with, then you're going to burn out in a hurry. Mm -hmm. So, because you, good, you will a, burn out. That, that's a good point about the burnout aspect. Too. How, yeah. how long can a person work on a job like this without being burned out? I mean, what, what do you do? I mean, I, can you can you spend 20 years on a job like no, this? No, 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 and you shouldn't have to. Hmm. Because after, I've always said that they ought to retire policemen after 15 years. 15 years? 15 years, yeah. Because after 15 years, you're grouchy, you're burnt out, you don't really care. And so what service are you providing? You're much better off to give the guy a good retirement because he did his time mm -hmm. and send him off. And let him, let somebody new come in and right, let them right. burn out. That's a tough, tough job. Yeah. Wow. wow. It's too tough to get. Are they doing that? Were they doing that? Thirty years. Doing? Anybody that can stay with a job for thirty years has got to be divorced, a drunk, an addict. Wow. And a, and a candidate for a heart attack. Wow. Too many policemen die just a short time after they retire. They don't get to enjoy their retirement. Jeez. It's too tough. That's a tough, tough job. It's a you tough know, job. You know, we're getting ready to take a short break, but as you notice, as we're going along, we're going to do more of this. But the bottom line is that um, I wanted to make sure you, you get this side of what it takes to be a, a cop. 
Yeah. And wearing that badge and wearing that uniform and the stress and the, all the kinds of things you have is just not normal life in many ways. No. And so this is why I wanted the reason why I wanted to do the show and and we really want to be thank I want to thank Don for being here and sharing this with us. We're gonna spend we're gonna take a short break and we're gonna come back and Don, we're gonna Okay. You mind? You okay? I'm fine, yeah. Okay, fine. We'll take a short break, folks, and we'll be right back. You are watching Oregon Voters Digest. This program can be seen again on these channels on these dates and times. Tell a friend. Welcome back, folks. Again, I'm Bruce Broussard, joined with Voters Digest. I'm your host today, and I've uh, got Don Dupay with me. We're learning about police work and what are they doing, and uh, and the work itself, you know, and 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 and, and the involvement. I mean, this is some heavy stuff. And here we are. We're playing the old divide line, the them against us type routine. And I wanted I wanted to do this show, and I'm so glad that Don is here because to give you the other side for a change. Mm -hmm. Give you the other side. This is not trying to be anti any particular person in the department who spent their years and their life, if you will, and uh, getting into that personal life. There's, there's a lot of personal things. No one wants to share those kinds of things. But I think it's very important right now because we're sort of at a crisis right now. You know, it's a them against us type of routine, and I think you need to hear this other side because you can't go. You can't. We can't really start solving the problem if we don't. If we don't know where we've been. <laughs> That's right. If we don't know where we've been. How can we go forward? So this is what we're talking about, and it's not basically taking any sides. It's just here. This is a real cop. This guy's been on the force. He's been around. He's here, and he happened to be a vet too. By the way, he had some good thoughts about, hey, I want to be a policeman back in those early days. He, that's what he wanted to do, and he burned out. I burned out. He just burned out, you know. And, and here he is today, but he's sharing it with us, and I think this is very, very important. And uh, so hopefully uh, you'll, you'll go out and you'll buy the book and, and read it yourself and dot the I's and cross the T's because especially those, especially those who are really in charge, we are in charge, the people are in charge, and the way we're in charge, we elect, we elect officials, if you will, to do the job. And in, in, in the city of Portland, it's the mayor of the city of Portland. And in the, the mayor today is Charlie Hale. He's in charge. So he's responsible, if you will. The mayor's position is responsible for what happens, if you will, if it's bad or good, one way or the other. He's in charge. And I, we need to, that, that needs to really come across home. I really want you to understand it. I understand it, especially now that I've spent the time, uh, besides the, like I say, I've spent the time a lot. I've been in the military before. It's a paraprofessional kind of a deal. Aspect of it. In fact, at one point in time, I thought I'd, I'd want to be a cop myself. But boy, after talking to Don, I said, I don't know whether I've been sitting here today. You know, I remember Smitty, a, a guy that I used to know in, in the yeah. police department when, uh, when, when I knew him real well when I was a Marine and I was recruiting over here off of Union Avenue at the time on yeah. Shaver and MLK. And, um, and Smitty tried to get me when I, was, when I got out of the Marine Corps to come on the force. But by George, I tell you, I, I don't know. But now, I, I, I don't know, second thoughts now. But anyway, uh, we've been we've been discussing police work with with Don, and we're just kind of filling you in, okay? And make one, sure one you... of the things that has, has always been involved in police work, and it gets worse as you are there longer, is the we they. The we they. Us them. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you know, because after a while, as a policeman, you begin to think everybody's got an angle. Mm. Everybody's a little bit crooked. Mm -hmm. And the truth of it is, that's not true. There are a lot of good people. There are a lot of wonderful people. So you get this, police work gives you that slant, that negative slant mm -hmm. that says, well, everybody's got an angle, so I got to watch out. Ah. I got I to gotta protect myself mm -hmm. from, what, what did it come from, from them. Where, where does that come from? It comes from experience. It comes from experience. Okay. It, it comes from 
uh, being around people who do have that angle mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and not being censured, since a policeman are not in contact with the ministers and the good guys, you're seeing the negativity and that negativity. So everybody looks the same. Everybody looks the same, you know. Everybody's got an angle mm -hmm. because you know it, because you arrested mm -hmm. it before. Mm -hmm. And so you know you don't get to see the good side of these people. Mm -hmm. So you get that slant, and that slant is part of your stress. Okay. That slant is part of... Uh, 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 what uh, contributes to your burnout? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I'm sick of you guys. Mm -hmm. I'm well, gonna go get drunk. Good point. Now you, 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 we hear this business about profiling. You know, that's yeah. coming. And a lot of times people tend to identify that from the standpoint of blacks. Mm -hmm. as, you know, the police are profiling black folks only, yeah. so to speak. But so what, you, what I'm hearing is that this culture is talking about. Actually, it's a profiling of everybody. Basically, just kind of a. Yeah. A, it's a culture, right? So to speak. You, you're always aware, re, re, regardless of what area you're in. Am I am I right? Or not? That's correct. Okay. Profiling is a word that's been kicked around for a long time, and uh, I wrestle with the question about profiling. Is profiling bad, or is profiling good police work? Okay. Okay. Uh, if I'm Riding around in my car or walking and I see something that I think is suspicious. Am I profiling you because you're black? Give us an example. Give us an example. Or are you or or, or am I profiling you because you're white? Okay. I think the best example I can give is myself. I was profiled. Okay. I was stopped by a Multnomah County deputy sheriff about four years ago. And he stopped me, not because I was, I had come from a tavern, I was with my son. Uh, and he stopped me, not because I was weaving or driving incorrectly. He stopped me because he wanted to see who was in a late model Cadillac without a state license plates hmm. after dark. Mm. That's mm. why he stopped me. Mm -hmm. Is that profiling? Well, yeah, it is. Mm -hmm. But he was doing his job. He, need, he needed to know who's in his district, who's in that car. And what are they doing? So the bad guys are always driving Cadillacs. Well, <laughs> <laughs> White it, it seems to is be. That, is that the deal? It seems to be. So the same, the same thing is the same thing as when I was a policeman. If if you if I'm working from Fremont to Killingsworth and from the River to Fifteenth, and you drive through my district, mm -hmm. I'm going to know who you are. That's my job. Mm -hmm. I want to know what your license number is. If you uh, have a record, what's your mugshot? Check I'm going to stop you. Okay. Because I need to know who's in my district doing what. Mm -hmm. Is that profiling? Probably. Is it good police work? I think so. Okay. So okay. it's a it's a slippery slope, Bruce. Okay. It's I a slippery you. slope. It's okay. But for but the it's most part, of part the job. It's, it's, it's part, part of the job. job. Okay. And it's then, part of the okay. job. Okay. Here's another one. You know, there was this business about tasering folks. You see, a lot of times you see people tasering folks, or whatever. But I thought this would be a good one. Since tasers have been declared electronic torture devices, I, mean, I want you to share, I want to explain that, by Amnesty International, why are they still being used? Is that, is that today? That's and today. Course, when, did it, when did it come on board? Did it come on board during your time? Tasers? No, we never had tasers. You never had tasers? We didn't have tasers. We didn't have mace. No mace? No. Mm -mm. It was hands-on. Uh, tasers are just short-handled cattle prods, is what they are. And when you pull the trigger on that, it goes snap, crackle, and pop. Mm -hmm. Scary thing. Mm -hmm. And it's a, it's a, it, just doing that scares people. Um, I don't think tasers should ever be used. Uh, when I ran for sheriff in 2006, one of my platforms was, I will get rid of tasers. The high sheriff of Multnomah County will not allow tasers in Multnomah County. Mm -hmm. I would have had a ceremonial burning. I would have invited the ACLU, and we'd have burned them all. Mm -hmm. mm. Interesting. Interesting. I think tasers should never be used. I know there's a lot of people who think, well, it saves lives. I can tase you rather than shoot you. Nonsense. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Police work got done, and it got done every day before we had tasers, before we had mace. Police work got done. Hmm. How did it ever happen? Hmm. Hmm. You know, you mentioned the point when, when I asked you that question. You said hands-on. Hands-on. What, what do you mean by hands-on? What do you mean? You just had to do the job. You, you just had, you didn't, you couldn't rely on technology. Okay. You okay. know, I couldn't stand uh, six feet away from me and spray with some mace. Mm -hmm. 
uh, I couldn't stand 15 feet away and shoot you with a taser. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I had to decide if you're committed a crime, if you're going to jail, I grabbed you uh, uh, and took you into custody. That's all there is to it. Now you had what slap sticks? What, 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 you had, well, you we had, had saps. Sticks, you know, had we had what, saps. What was the sap? What was that? Sap is a lead weighted, lead weighted uh, smacker. Is what right. It okay. Is, okay. You know, okay. and we also used sap gloves, which were okay. lead weighted gloves, okay. which okay. protected your hands okay. and also gave you more. So you would shoot first. You, you just no, we didn't shoot first. Yeah. No. Okay. Okay. Shooting, shooting. We didn't shoot people in those days like they do now. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, today, if a guy is a threat, if a cop is threatened by a knife, the first thing they do is tase him or shoot him. Hmm. I was threatened by lots of guys with knives. I never shot one of them. Hmm. Hmm. So, hmm. no. That's that's a good Tas point. Tasers are tasers are electronic torture devices, and they should be eliminated immediately. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, another issue: uh, the idea is that when a person who's telling the truth, if you will, uh, before the judge or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, you got into the, the idea of the, the, you think that pro, you, you think that there will ever be honesty in police report writing? Never. Why is that? Because the philosophy of the police is that it doesn't make any difference what you did. It's what I tell the judge you did. That's what's important, and that's what's going to be on my report. Because hmm. uh, the judge is going to believe me. And it doesn't make any difference what you think. So that's the first thing that disappears. And it disappeared my first day on the job, hmm. is honesty in police report writing. It but where do we go wrong on that piece? I mean, the judge had to write, I mean, there had to be some policy making or something. Like that. Well, where do we go wrong on that whole issue? Where we go wrong is the judge takes at face value everything that the policeman says in a, in a report. Should he? No. Well, why is it? Because because it's slanted. It's not correct. The first thing that disappears is the truth. So it, whether it's an affidavit for a search warrant, or it's uh, I say that you jaywalked and you didn't. It's it's that basic honesty that just disappears, and it's just it's just the nature of the beast. That's there, they will never be honesty in police report writing. Every report that you see is going to be embellished, or slanted. Uh, toward the officer's favor. But what about internal affairs? That's what they are supposed to be doing. <laughs> I mean, they're supposed to be checking that thing out. I mean, you know what I mean? We got a police review board. I mean, we got a, we, 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 What's up? <laughs> I'm laughing. <laughs> internal affairs is the worst disaster ever inflicted upon the people for a number of reasons. Number one, the 14th Amendment says that equal justice for all. That's yeah. what it says. Equal yeah. justice for all. It doesn't say the electricians can have their own police department, their own justice system. It doesn't say the plumbers can have their own justice system. And it certainly doesn't say the policemen can have their own justice system. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what internal affairs is. It's their own justice system. Because if you mess up as a policeman, internal affairs are going to decide if you made a mistake. They're going to assess a penalty, and that's what the judge does. The penalty is usually suspension from duty for 30 days or something like that. So they've assessed a, a, a monetary penalty and they decided you're guilty. That's, that's illegal. Hmm. Plain and simple illegal. Now, it's in the union contract that you can do that. Do what? what say Internal again? affairs is in the union contract. How can a union contract have something that violates the 14th Amendment to the Constitution? That needs to be stopped and needs to be stopped immediately. Again, when I ran for sheriff, that was one of my platforms. I would have the county attorney immediately file a lawsuit in federal court stopping internal affairs because it's simply illegal. Hmm. Another, another question that comes up all the time, you know, people say it all the time. So, well, gee whiz, a person shoots a guy or does something wrong or whatever, uh, and all of a sudden they get they, they, they get off with paid leave. Yeah. Is that is that okay? Well, paid leave is probably not the best word. Probably not the best word oh, because yeah. it sounds like you get a vacation if you shoot somebody. Yeah, but that's that's what normally people that's, say. That, I, but yeah. I, I I say that wrong. So. Yeah, that's so what, that, that's not. What do you not, think about that? And why, and why 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 they do that? Well, one of the things that, one of the things that they do wrong is 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 they allow a policeman forty eight hours yeah. to get their story straight.
to get their story straight. Get their story straight, that's right. And that's against any best practices for investigative work. If I arrest two burglars, the first thing I'm going to do is separate them. Mm -hmm. Now you don't get to talk to each other. You don't get to get your story straight. Mm -hmm. You get two policemen in a car and they shoot somebody or they screw up somehow. Oh, they get 48 hours to get their story straight. What? Get together? Get together? No, uh-uh. It's wrong. Hmm. Hmm. It's 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 not in any. It's not good for the. It's not good. It's not good police work. Not yeah. good police work. Yeah. It's bad for the citizens who have to suffer because of it. It's not best practices in investigative work at all. But but my point is that you can't pretty well tell you what's going to happen when you get into i.e. apprehending the person. You so, can't tell. Uh, you know what I'm saying? But my point is that, that but after it's done, why can't you just write it down just the way it happened? Because you'd be snitching on your partner. Or your partner might be snitching on you if you did something wrong. Hmm. Do, do they feel as if they're going to get fired too if they all of a sudden... They... There's there always that possibility they're afraid that they are liable to get fired or they're going to lose 30 days pay. Yeah, they're going to get suspended. It's and about to eat. It's about, it's about the eating. It's about to eat. It's you about eat. the money. You got, you got to eat. It's about yeah. the money. But yeah. they got to eat. But they weren't, they weren't paid during your time. Yeah. No. They weren't paid during your time, no. right? No. No. But now they're not being paid now. But, uh, but not we, did, we didn't have an administrative leave if we shot somebody. I never shot anybody. We didn't have that, no. Wow, wow, wow. Now, let's, let's talk about command structure. Now, this is, this is a question. Is the command structure at Portland Public, uh, Portland, I'll give you this, Portland Public School, <laughs> Portland Police Bureau, uh, heavy? In other words, are there too many in the administration and not enough cops on the street? Well, absolutely. I'm still trying to figure out what police lieutenants do. <laughs> I've never been able to figure that out. Uh, <clears throat> each precinct has a captain. Each captain has his own personal police car. Each captain has their own secretarial staff. Uh, do we need, I don't know how many there are now, Bruce. When I was a cop, it was probably 11 or 12 captains. Now there's, I'm sure there's more than that. Hmm. And in those days, a police captain made maybe thirty or forty thousand a year. Now they make three times that much. Hmm. And so they're highly paid, and they need to be. They they need to go back to kind of a military rule of how many people you can supervise. It, you if you if a sergeant can supervise four or five, a lieutenant can supervise. Eight or ten, you yeah, know, okay. and then the captain's got all oh, of the yeah, guys okay. in the precinct that he okay. supervises. There's just too many of them. They need to get rid of the, a lot of the people in the command structure and put policemen back on the street. Hmm. We need policemen on the street. I don't need captains sitting up there figuring out what I did wrong. Mm -hmm. How much time do you think a, uh, an officer should be on the street before they get maybe even considered to be an officer? Officer? Yeah. Yeah, in the police force. Well... I'm not sure what you like, mean I'm by that. I'm talking like a sergeant. I'm just saying. Well, you know, I... Prison you, gets promoted. You know, a lot of times, a lot of these folks are just educated. I mean, they, yeah. they're well educated. You know, they can pass tests. Some people can pass tests. Some people can't. I'm, I'm not, I I'm think just, that you need at least five years' experience in order to... Before, if if you need... If you don't have five years' experience, you're not a veteran officer. And you shouldn't be allowed to take a, a test for promotion until you're a veteran. Until you've had enough experience. On the street. Experience. Then, on, the street. The, on the street. Being, you know, being on the that street. Makes sense. Are most of them that way, you think? Well, not nowadays. They're, uh, they've lowered the time required for promotional exam to three years. Three years. Three years. It was five years when I was a policeman, and I think that's a good thing. They should go back to it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, with three years on, you've, your probation's a year and a half. So how much experience do you have before you can take a test to be sergeant? Mm -hmm. The other problem with it is, is that men that are good police officers are often not good test takers. People that are good test takers are sometimes not very good policemen. Mm -hmm. And I find that command structure when I was there was rampant with that. Mm. Guys who were good test takers and never really very good policemen. But they got promoted. They got promoted because they took the tests and they were able to pass them. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I tell you what, we got about, we got about maybe five or six minutes I'd like for you to share with uh, one, with the public, i.e., the public, mm -hmm. i.e., the leaders. I mean, the, the, the actual the people who are supposed to be in the leadership role, mm -hmm. who are very concerned about public safety, they want public safety or whatever. I'd like to talk to you, let, I'd like for you to say something to them about what do you think about 
what can you say to them about what 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 is good police work and what should they be looking for and uh, one in the police and and i e the leader in, in the police work needs to be <clears throat> more open and more transparent and it's not because the police officers aren't uh they're not held responsible to the citizens that they work for. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know of any other job where you're not responsible to your employers. If you mess up on a regular job, your boss has to deal with you. Uh, you mess up on a police department, internal affairs, and or the union steps in and protects you against hmm. your employers, the city. And then the the people are always saying, well, no matter what happens, the police never are found accountable. Mm -hmm. And that's the problem because mm -hmm. it, there's no not enough transparency. And where does that go? That goes right to the mayor. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That goes right to the mayor who is either uh, afraid of the union or doesn't want to tackle the union, who doesn't want to attack the structure that permits that. And so the transparency that's necessary can never be there the way the the way that the uh, the structure is now, mm -hmm. because the mayor is not the mayor. Mm -hmm. The mayor is a uh, uh, a pawn, if you will, mm -hmm. of the union. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He needs the union support to get reelected. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, that's not public safety. Public safety. Yeah. <laughs> now, it's what not about? about public so, what, so, what do you say to you, to, to i.e. Uh, your, your former comrades? Well, there's not too many people like uh, living here today. But, but what do you say to the policeman that's out here on the street today? What do you say to the cop today? Quit. We, we said a couple of things here. We Quit. said a few things here. Huh? Get out of law enforcement before it destroys you. You say 15 years, right? 15 years is is uh, yeah. I wish I wish I'd have stayed for five years, gone to law school used that time to uh, get a better education and gone on with something else. Mm -hmm. Because here I am now, at my age, I have extreme PTSD. Mm -hmm. You know, and it, and it really bothers me a lot of times. I can't still go by some of the areas in town where really terrible things happened. Mm -hmm. uh, it was really painful for me in a lot of ways to write some of the stuff down in the book because I had to relive the murders, uh, the suicides, uh, the heads blown off, that mm -hmm. sort of thing. And that's the kind of stuff that will drive you crazy yeah. if you stay in police work yeah. that long. Mm -hmm. I don't know how anybody can survive 25 years of it. I don't know. They shouldn't quit. That's my advice. Young, idealistic guys, get out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Save your life. Find another job. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. Oh, yeah. I found myself with that same trouble when I was teaching at the police academy. Here I am, how am I gonna be honest with these young recruits and tell them the truth? That your life's work is an exercise in futility. Hmm. How do you stand up there and tell them that unless you're honest about it? Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, son. Your life's work is an exercise in futility. I don't care how many burglars you arrest, there's gonna be burglars. I don't care how many murderers you arrest, there's gonna be murderers. I don't care how many thieves you catch, you're gonna be thieves. And at the end of the year, what have I accomplished? Mm -hmm. hmm. Hmm. Not, much. Hmm. Hmm. Not much. Can you raise a family in, in, in the police department, you think, in the police work? I was able to raise a family, okay. but then <clears throat> we were so low paid, my wife had to work all the time, so it took two incomes then. Uh, it probably does take two incomes now, because mm -hmm. a lot of things are so much more expensive. Mm -hmm. You mentioned PTSD. Now you got a psych. You guys have a psych. I mean, they've always had a psych in, for police work. A yeah. Person is having some problems, stressing out this, that, and the other. He goes to them, and no. then after he gets out of the door, okay, he's fine. No, we never had that. I never had. You that. had no psych. There, there was no. You there was your own, no yeah. there, the what only you think, person. What do you think about the psych? The only people that we were that uh, I could go talk to was a police chaplain. A chaplain. The chaplain. That's yeah. a psych. And his name was Ed Stell, a wonderful okay. man. Uh, he was he was the de facto. Okay. Uh, counselor. Did it help out? Yeah, he helped me out a lot. Okay. He did. Okay. But there was no there was no stress pension. No stress pension. There was no way to get out unless you had a heart attack or died or Gee. or uh, served your time. Gee. I couldn't I couldn't do it because my health was deteriorating so fast. I was afraid I was going to die, 
And that's why I had to leave the police to be armed. Well, you spent 17 years. You are getting a pension, I take it, right? No, I don't get a pension. You're not getting a pension. I don't get a pension, no. I left, and I've never been sorry that I left because I'm here alive today. And a lot of these young fellows, uh, they're not here, they're dead because they're stressed out. No, I don't get a pension. Mm -mm. Wow. Buy the book. Wow, yeah, buy the book. That's, that's an interesting piece about that. I mean, I, I don't understand something. They, they pretty well knew that you were pretty well stressed out. A lot of these folks are stressed out aspect of it. And, uh, well, I, I'm, I'm getting into the book now a little bit. Yeah, well. You quit, <clears throat> but the bottom line is that you should have gotten the pension or something. I should have got some kind of a pension. I always thought that two plus two equals four. If I got PTSD from the police department, right. and I did, I was diagnosed with it, then you owe me a pension. Right, right. And, what, well, you didn't pay into the system. You didn't pay into the present system, so you don't get a pension. So there was a lot of politics involved at that time. Mm -hmm. Some of the people that are not named in the book were responsible for my not getting a pension. Wow, so. wow, wow. That's something you may want to review again. Yeah. Okay. Well, folks, we have been spending the time with Don Juppé, and, and hopefully we, you've gotten a sort of a, a feel, an, an entree, if you will, before you read the book. If yeah. you got to get the book, I'm sure it'll, it'll dot the I's for you and, and fill in the blanks for at least some of it. Because it is a, we are in a crisis at this point in time. We, we are. We've got to get down to the point where we can talk about solutions. Mm -hmm. We do need public safety. Uh, we do need personnel, if you will, to cover that. We do need folks on the, on the beat, if you will. Uh, we knew, we need, do need law enforcement, if you will. It's a very, very stressful, stressful job. Uh, and so consequently, these people have to be paid right, I, I, as far as I'm concerned. They need to be paid, uh, and then the public need to understand uh, uh, that uh, wh who is the leader and what is that leadership. It's, it's a very situation. It's a tough, tough situation. So, Don, I want to thank you very much for, for being here, and, and we're going to do this again. Bruce, it's yeah. been my pleasure, and I'm it's looking forward to doing some more. <clears throat> so please get out there and look at the Behind the Badge in River City. It's a very interesting book, and, and I think, I'm sure you'll enjoy it. And, and like I said, uh, hopefully you'll, you'll have a – wow. I'm still, I'm still annoyed by it. I mean, every time I pick up the paper, I'm, I'm thinking about Don Dupre yeah. reading that book. But again, it's been a pleasure. Okay, Don? Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Well, folks, that's it. Hopefully you've learned this. I tell your friends. We do a repeat, you know, this piece. And you can get on YouTube, too, and check it out. And we're all going to be doing a little bit more with, with Don in the future, okay? Have a good evening. I'll see you next week. Take care. Have a good one.